Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's that time. Um, the woman who we're going to sit down and talk to today has been named to just about every top anything list that you can come up with. Not only does she have the distinction of being a huge success in high tech, but she is a she who is a huge success in high tech, which is something that we will talk about today. Uh, she's a woman of color in a field that is, as we know, uh, generally populated by fat, old, white guys like me. So uh, she has a really unique journey that she will share with us. She did get her undergraduate degree from Michigan, but then, like most successful people, she went on and got the obligatory Harvard Business degree as a follow-on for her career. She's worked for such companies as Twitter, Quora, Path. She's now at Yahoo. She's a fervent Michigan sports fan and all-around great person. Let's give a very warm welcome to Erin Teague. So now Erin. Yes. They literally used to call this class the fat, old, rich, how I got lucky guy class. <laughs> so um, I think one of the things that's interesting is you've done this class before. Yes. Thanks and for having you, me back. You will, because you have been the highest rated speaker for this class wow. in five years. Wow. So, Was I the only speaker? No, <laughs> but so they'll be evaluating you again this year. So let's see if you can keep your, your, your string intact. Um, you've been quoted in the past as saying that when you arrived at college, nobody looked like me. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Uh, so first of all, thank you for having me back. Um, it is an honor for me to, to be here. This is, coming back in this, in this invitation is, is not something that I take lightly. Um, coming back to campus is, is always like filled with nostalgia and, and mixed emotions, and so it's, it's, it's great to be back. Um, and so thank you for having me, um, and thank you for, for taking the time to, to do this. So I think for me, um, kind of coming to the University of Michigan uh, was a huge accomplishment for me, for my family, and um, it, you know, it was a very unique experience because I came from, I grew up in an environment, um, I grew up in Southfield, Michigan, about 30 to 45 minutes away from here, and uh, it was a predominantly black environment. And so racially, it was uh, uh, coming and matriculating at, at the University of Michigan um, was, was filled with, in a lot of ways, culture shock. Um, and so I was, uh, you know, enrolled in the College of Engineering. I was. Um, uh, declared an EECS major, electrical engineering, computer science, and um, was the only black woman in my class. And so for me, that was um, a, a very unique experience juxt juxtaposed against the uh, experience that I had growing up, K-12. And how prepared were you? Did you know how to write code when you came to be an EECS major? <laughs> <laughs> not only did I not know how to write code, I didn't even know what a programming language was uh, when I was a freshman, uh, when I matriculated. Like, the, the, the word Java meant coffee, like C++ was like the third letter in alphabet, and then these two, um, you know, math terms, like it didn't, it just like nothing, um, I, I had zero exposure uh, to, to, to um, computer programming, and so I, I was starting from like ground zero, but in a lot of ways it was actually starting from a, from a negative place because, um, you know, we were graded on a, on a curve here, right, and so, um, for me, it, it, it was a function of like um, kind of overcoming the steep learning curve just to be in a position to compete with, with my peers. And I understand there's a um, Aaron Teague Memorial Corner of the Duderstadt, given the <laughs> amount of time you spent there. I lived in the Dude. Um, I, at the time, it actually wasn't even uh, called the Duderstadt Center. It was called the Media Union. And, uh, and like the staff and employees of the Media Union they knew me, knew my name, knew my uh, study regime, they knew my schedule. Um, that's how much time I spent there. It was, it was home to the extent that I would be offended if I was in class and someone came to my spot and, uh, and took my spot. So it was... Um, it Nothing's was changed in that regard, <laughs> I assure you. Now, one other question about college. I know you're a talented athlete, but um, your father forbade you from doing something in college. What and why? Oh, wow, you've done your research. Um, so my father played uh, sports in college, uh, was also drafted and uh, played in the NFL. And, um, and so for, for him, the experience of being a, a college football player 
at a, you know, D1 powerhouse that was going after national championships. Um, it, it was a kind of a, an experience where he wasn't necessarily a student. And so uh, for, for my brother and I growing up, he wasn't uh, supportive and in fact completely discouraged us from playing sports in college. Uh, the message was very clear, which was that we should focus on um, academics and if we were to get scholarships, uh, they, they had to have been academic scholarships. Um, and, because, and that's like a function of the fact that, you know, uh, he grew up very poor and, um, and probably would not have gone to college had it not been for uh, his athletic scholarship. And so for him, he was literally like a athlete, forced to be an athlete first and then a student second. Um, and so I think the desire for us was that we be students first and focus on academics and like really max out um, in terms of uh, the full student experience. And Okay, one more for me before I turn it over to John and Tori. Okay. How are you the same and how are you different than your 18-year-old self? Wow, that's incredibly <laughs> introspective. Uh, so I think and this is like one of the biggest. I could just say like, is Twitter fun to work at or? <laughs> That's true. Those would have been easy questions. Yeah. Um, uh, so how am I the same? I think um, th there are things that I learned uh, that kind of make me who I am growing up and, and definitely here in terms of like work ethic, discipline, um, kind of living, you know, like my life in a certain way. Um, and, and, and like, Obviously, I focus on, on achievement. I, I am like naturally an achievement-oriented person, um, and that is still true. So like, you know, uh, it was funny. I, I was having um, a conversation with a friend, and um, you know, I have an Apple Watch now, and he's like, if, if, at the time, I did not have one. He's like, you should just go buy an Apple Watch. And I'm like, no, I, I can't just go buy an Apple Watch. Like, I, I should have to achieve something before I, and that's like my reward is buying myself an Apple Watch as a result of achieving something, right? And so just like kind of just being like an achievement-oriented uh, person. And so that's kind of how those are some of the ways that, that I'm saying. In terms of how I'm different, um, I'm such a different person in just like the extent to which I've been exposed uh, to life and the elements of life. And these are things that have influenced me heavily. So um, I think the biggest thing is just like travel around the world and understanding like different environments, uh, different value systems, different cultures um, has helped me to become a more, a much an infinitely more uh, well-rounded person. And, um, and th that, those experiences definitely have shaped my worldview, have shaped uh, the ability um, or the extent to which kind of I, I believe in, um, you know, the importance of giving back and staying connected to my community and like really having that impact um, in, the, in the communities that I care most about. And so I think that's kind of like, the areas where I've developed or achieved like the most growth. Okay, Tori? Yeah, so you just talked about traveling the world. What are some of the places that you've been that impacted you the most? Great question. So I, um, during grad school, I wanted to visit the BRIC countries, B-R-I-C, which was Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Um, and their kind of term, the term the BRIC countries um, is based off of like this Goldman Sachs report um, that said that like these four countries will be like the highest or fastest growing in terms of um, their increase in, in overall G GDP, um, the rate of development, um, and the extent to which they uh, impact the world economy. And so I was like, I gotta go to these countries, right? And so I think um, what has been interesting is un to understand uh, what it means to live in a developing uh, country, a developing economy, what um, the pros and cons of, of those scenarios are. I understand uh, global um, economic poverty in a completely new way, right? Like what it means to live in poverty in Brazil is very different than what it means to live in poverty in India, and it's very different than what it means to live in poverty in, in the United States, and, um, and like what the psychological implications of living in poverty are, and how that relates to, to crime rates, for example, and, and how that ultimately relates to, to GDP and like impacts the, um, the political system. And, and so like those are the things that I think fascinate me is all like sheer macroeconomics, I guess. Um, uh, so yeah, so, so I think like in terms of the best places I've ever visited, uh, Paris is I think the best city in the world. Um, I think I would say probably like Hong Kong might be number two, right? Um, these are cities that are global in nature, very unique. 
cultures, um, and I think. Same favorite city. Do we really? Paris and Hong Kong. Wow. I'm studying abroad in Paris next semester. Really? Too. It's good to hear, yeah. It's an amazing city. It is an amazing city. Uh, tons of, you got to watch the carbs that you eat, though. I, I <laughs> ate, uh, I ate so much in Paris. Those crepes, macarons. So building off of uh, one of Tom's questions earlier regarding athletics, although you yourself you know, haven't led a career in professional athletics, you do tweet a lot uh, about sports, and especially women in sports. Um, and so one of the things I'm curious about is, when is Jim Harbaugh giving you the keys to the castle, and when are you the first female coach of Michigan Wolverines football team? <laughs> no, you should have asked her. She roots for the 49ers and the Lions. So if they're playing each other, which side of the stadium are you going to be on? Oh, I'm hometown loyal. I'm definitely, I root for Detroit sports teams over any other city, regardless of where I live. You haven't been rooting hard enough for the mm, Lions. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> Oh, and three. Yeah, we're, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a tough, uh, it's, it's going to be, a, we're, we have an uphill battle, but our Wolverines are doing well. Um, so that's, that is the most exciting thing. Um, super, obviously, pro um, Michigan Wolverine football. Let's talk a little bit more about your career. So earlier in your career, you worked for high growth companies that were on that type of trajectory. And you've recently made the decision to go to what is basically a turnaround. Yes. So, can you talk a little bit about both types of experiences yes. and the time that you've been at Yahoo, compare and contrast those very, very different startup dynamics? Yes, great, great, great point. Um, so, you know, like Twitter path, like super hyper growth. Um, I joined path just south of 500 people, so within the first like 500, I mean, sorry, Twitter, within the first uh, 500 employees at Twitter. And, um, you know, we were on a, a, a rapid like hyper growth trajectory, uh, the challenges there were really around scale, right? Um, the technical challenges were infinite because uh, we were in, you know, like Twitter's optimized for like this real time stream of tweets and like the feed has to be, has to like work, right? And at the time, um, we would experience these spikes in, in volume and traffic that uh, we like literally would not have predicted or couldn't have predicted because they were based on things that were happening in the world that couldn't be predicted, like an earthquake, like a tsunami, like an upwarring in, um, in Egypt. You know, that was one of the experiences where we experienced it's a, a, a spike in volume. And um, we literally just could not scale um, our systems, our backend systems, like our servers were burning. Uh, and so that was a type of child where there were pure technical um, and, and like really understand how you, how you grow. And then on the, on the people side of the business, the challenges were related to um, how do you maintain a culture? How do you establish cultural values and norms given the fact that you're hiring 30, 30 to 40 people a week? And then eventually hiring 100 people a week, right? Like literally 100 new, like you're like, you know, adding 20% of your workforce in like a day. <laughs> Um, and so how do you ensure that like cultural norms and values? And how do you do that? What did you learn? Um, so, you know, like we, we set up um, a set of core values and it was really around like teaching and enforcing. Um, and, and by enforcing, we mean like having it be a part of the conversation um, of our values. Like I, like I can recite the Twitter values still and I haven't worked there in several years. Um, and, you know, in, in like, conversations and meetings, we would talk about the values and we would make decisions, um, product decisions based on our value, right? So one of one cor cor corporate value at Twitter was um, to reach every person on the planet, right? And so if we were having conversations and there's a trade-off between like doing something that required um, scale and doing something that was a better like from a product feature perspective, we were making the decision based on scale because we were like, we have to reach every person on the planet. Um, and so that's, so that's different than a company like Yahoo where, um, you know, established company, been around for 20 years and uh, 12,000 employees, already big, already very mature. Um, the challenge at a company like Yahoo that is a, in a turnaround um, situation is really like, how, on the people side is how do, you, um, how do you change a culture? So someone who is, um, you know. You a, fire a, them. <laughs> That's easier, easier said than done, so, you know, like not everyone is, uh, I mean, like you could have like an amazing team of people, but just aren't culturally aligned um, with like the direction of the company. And so like, and, and it's not necessarily their fault, right? And so like the onus is on the leadership 
um, you know, and, and everyone is kind of positioned and empowered to be a leader in this way, but to change the dynamic and the culture of the team. I wanted to ask about how empowered you are because you work for someone who is notoriously hands-on and notoriously detail-oriented. So what has the experience been like working with Marissa and how much autonomy do you have in, for example, making decisions about changes to user experience and sure. some of the products you're working on? Sure. Uh, so right now I'm, um, uh, so I'm on the fantasy sport. I'm user girl for uh, Yahoo Fantasy and Sports uh, products. And um, <laughs> interestingly, uh, the it, 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 I'm, it's like the perfect intersection for me between my passion around sports and technology and user experiences. And so. Um, my CEO, Marissa, is not as much of a sports fan as you might imagine, and so her, her feedback so on our products is, is a little bit different now than I'm on the, uh, the sports team than it was previously. Um, but, you know, I have a, a tremendous amount of respect for her. I think she's an incredible leader. Um, she is, has achieved amazing feats in such a short period of time um, at the helm of Yahoo. And for me, um, you know, her, her, the extent to which she's hands-on is actually like only beneficial because, um, you know, she's had such a wealth of experiences throughout her career uh, at Google, you know, one of these like iconic, the, potentially the most prolific company of my lifetime thus far. And uh, to be in a decision maker at that company for so long. I happen to know insider information. She was very instrumental in your recruiting to Yahoo. <laughs> Can you share a little bit of what she said to you that made you willing to jump into that situation? I think just, um, so just, uh, so she really described kind of her vision in the, in the future for Yahoo and like her thought process in making the decision um, to leave, you know, Google to, to run a company like Yahoo that was in the midst of a turnaround. Um, and I think kind of describing like what the future of this company could be, who, um, who she brought on board to lead, uh, the extent to which um, she really believed in the in the product and like the core competencies of of our company um, and where we could be differentiators in the space and I think like once that vision um, became much clearer to me and then just kind of describing the opportunity like for me to be at um, you know an iconic company in Silicon Valley um, working on a product that is, 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 you know, an amazing product. Like, I was been a leader in fantasy sports since the beginning of fantasy sports. Um, and, and it's, a, you know, like a tremendous passion of mine. Those, um, you know, those are opportunities that I'm not sure I wouldn't have got, would have gotten anywhere else. But I think the biggest thing for me actually um, had less to do with what she actually said and more to do with who she is. And for me, to work for a leader who has established um, credibility, who is a woman, who is technical, every bit um, the engineer and a technical brain is, is any of the brightest engineers in, in Silicon Valley, but also an expert in, in user um, experience and, a, and a, you know, very thoughtful thinker in terms of design. I think um, that opportunity to learn from someone like that to me was invaluable and is, um, is worth like its weight in gold. Is there truth to the rumor, well, John, you were going to ask this question about how often um, Aaron applies for jobs? Oh, yeah. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll dive a little bit deeper into that, too. One of the things that you mentioned the last time that you were here is that you, you try to apply to a job at least every year um, just to have that experience and to, and to keep your options open. Um, and one of the things that I'm curious about... Do you uh, have commitment issues, Aaron? <laughs> I might have commitment issues. <laughs> well, I'm just curious from a, from a product manager standpoint in terms of being able to build teams and having had different experiences at different companies. Is there some sort of dream team? Is there some sort of mix or melding of all of these different companies that you've spent time with that makes the perfect product team or you know, a different mission or vision for each of these different companies? I mean, I'm just curious to get some of your insights on that. Yeah, so the, you know, like functionally, the what makes a good product manager, I think, is the same across um, like the consumer web and, and mobile space, um, and so like those kind of functional elements are are the same. But what difference is like what the difference is the makeup of the company. So every company is a little bit different, right? So some tech companies are more design driven and design oriented, and so the best product managers there. I would say probably prioritize like design thinking over some of the other decisions that they're making when they're when they're doing going through prioritization exercises. Some companies, so like the design company that comes to mind, um, Path was design oriented. Um, 
uh, Airbnb is design oriented, right? And then, and then you have companies that are more engineering oriented, right? And that, that companies that fall into that, that category would be like a Google or a, um, you know, a Facebook, right? And so like having really super solid um, product managers who um, understand technology, who have a computer science background, who, you know, have been engineers, right, functionally, um, and, and like really understand trade-offs that you're making, I mean, prioritizing is, is important. Who's your dream team? Three people, designer, front end, back end. Wow, you want me to actually name names? Of anybody in the world. You, could, you can throw oh. Sergey Brin on your team. Okay, well, hey, let's do that. So <laughs> on the design front, um, Johnny Ive uh, from um, Apple. I'll take uh, engineer, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, um, and product, probably Marissa, Marissa Mayer. And when's the fantasy sports app for this coming along? <laughs> Limited user base. Okay. <laughs> can, can I ask you as, as a follow-on to that? Can colleges teach students how to be product managers? Because there are no courses in how to be a product manager. And people that I've talked to in tech say, we always have to start from ground zero, regardless of what school we recruit from. Mm -hmm. Are there skills that students should be trying to acquire or experiences while they're here before they come to you? Yes, absolutely. I think, the, the, to me, um, you know, while in school, it's really important to, um, to, to build something, right? I think having the computer science background is tremendously important if you're interested in becoming a product manager because at the end of the day, you're working with engineers. Like the engineers are building on your team, are building the, the product. Um, and so being able to accurately assess like um, what it really takes to build a feature um, that, that you're hoping to launch and how long that might take and to be able to scope that is important, right? And so um, having credibility with that team of engineers requires a technical aptitude and requires a background in computer science. So that, I can't, I can't overstate that. See, now I never got that, but I learned that if you bought, bought Maker's Mark by the case and you left a bottle in the engineering pit every once in a while. That'll make you very popular. That'll make you very popular. <laughs> Absolutely. I think the other thing in addition to like the technical piece is, um, is, is an aptitude for design. I think that is becoming increasingly important. Um, and that's something that's really changed uh, within this like next wave of companies. Um, I think people um, are, are more interested in, in um, experiences where they feel delighted and, and engaged. And part of that is overcoming like these, like achieving technical feats. But part of that is also just like a great user experience, right? It might not be super technical, but you just feel delighted when you're using a product. Do you have a product litmus test that involves some of your other family members along those lines? <laughs> I do. In fact, um, my, I, I, uh, I get my mom to, pl to do, so like, so, so anything, any product that I'm working on, any company I work for, my mom always signs up for an account if she doesn't previously have one and actively engages. And so, she, uh, she is a commissioner of our family's um, fantasy sports team, fantasy football team. And, um, and I'm always like, hey, mom, what'd you think about this experience? Like, you know, we, we smack talk, right? So every Sunday she, she, smack, she smack talks with everyone else in the family. And so she, she's the commissioner of a fantasy sports team. Um, and I was like, hey, mom, what was your draft experience like? And so it's really cute, right? It's, it's, uh, it's great. But, if my mom can do it, right, if she can use these products and understand the flows, and I'm always asking her questions like, you know, do you understand the intent? Like, how was this flow? Was it, was it, did it take too long? Like, did it make sense to you? Um, what, what, what felt good about it? What didn't feel good about it? And so she's my, like, I, so it's a constant usability study um, that, that we partake in. And, um, and we launched a, a brand new product, um, a daily fantasy game. Um, a couple months ago, and, and so my mom participates in our like million dollar challenge every week. Um, and so it's, it is, uh, it's great to get that feedback. Now what are the rules if she were to win something like that? <laughs> well, she's not getting any insider information from me. I, I guarantee you that. Um, it's just, so there's no, there, there, there's no restrictions there, but, um, and you know, she actually hasn't won anything, to be fair. But she participates, which I think is which I think is great. But uh, but getting that feedback from her, I mean, that's like you know she's in the world. She's not um, she's not incredibly technical, uh, and so she's she's a user base that that is um, that's very very helpful for me. 
I'm going to Tori, I'm going to let you take a question. I'm going to come out in the audience and let some people out here ask questions as well. What makes Silicon Valley different than the rest of the world? That's a great question. Um, there, you know, I think right now, so Silicon Valley is, in my opinion, the epicenter of innovation. And, um, and that is, is, is proven to me because um, if you think about like disruption, right, the, the extent to which software is disrupting every industry, every industry vertical, right? If you think about like various startups that have um, completely disrupted the existing incumbent um, uh, industry vertical, that, that like the epicenter of where these companies live and were founded um, is Silicon Valley. And that has always been true from Fairchild Semiconductor and the initial chips, Intel, um, right? That's how it became Silicon Valley, uh, all the way through t today, where um, you know we live in a, a, a consumer web and mobile uh, world, right? Like that that experience, I don't think could happen anywhere else. It's the reason why you know Mark Zuckerberg, sophomore year in college, founded Facebook that summer. He went to Silicon Valley, right? He knew that he had to be in the epicenter, and um, and so why? So then, so that's what makes a difference, like the epicenter of um, of innovation, but what what like sustains that over time, and it's because there's an ecosystem that exists in Silicon Valley that doesn't exist anywhere else. It's access to capital in the context of um, you know of venture deals, right? So it's easier, um, I think, if you're based in Silicon Valley, to have access to uh, to VCs and um, have an opportunity to be able to pitch these VCs to raise money. Um, it is access to talent, right? So like um, you know, it, in a lot of ways, like culturally. Silicon Valley might be considered a little bit incestuous because, you know, people, myself included, who've worked at, um, you know, like the Googles and the Facebooks um, and like the, you know, Uber and Twitter and, and Yahoo, like we all kind of know each other. We've all kind of been working at these different companies. These companies poach from one another and recruit from one another. And so, um, and so like the, you know, the, the talent base is there, right? So you have like capital, you have talent, and then you have like, um, the, the fact that people culturally be, tend to believe and support ideas that don't exist in the world, um, it, I think is supported in Silicon Valley in a way that's not supported um, anywhere else. Do you think there's a downside to being potentially myopic or, or focusing so much on a specific type of innovation that the Valley breeds and if it truly is the center and everybody in the center sort of has a similar idea of what innovation looks like or what the 21st or 22nd century looks like, yeah. can that also have a downside as well? Yes, absolutely. I think, um, I think to some extent it could lead to um, a warped reality, right, um, in terms of what you might believe is possible or what you think um, actually could add realistic value to the world. John, are you smack talking as soon as I leave the stage down there? <laughs> we have some questions out here in the audience for you, Erin. Um, so like you've previously, st previously stated, um, you've looked around in education and in the workforce and said no one has looked, uh, looked like me. Um, so being an extremely successful woman in engineering, what advice do you have to future women engineers about uh, facing that challenge? I think, I think that's a great question. I think uh, being a woman, and for me being a black woman, um, makes me unique in, in the field of engineering. And so the, the, there are like two pieces of advice. The first is, um, as a person who is unique, as a person, as a woman, as a person of color, um, I think recognizing what makes you unique. What, what is it about your experiences that makes you unique, right? It's obviously like your gender, but there's an experience um, that you've had that maybe no one else has had, right? So like I'm in meetings with my team um, and we're debating features and I always have a unique perspective on, on a feature or a set of features because I've had a different set of experiences in life because I can relate to a user base that is just like a little bit different, right? Um, and I relate to like specifically um, a, a user base that acts, actively uses the product. Um, and so I think, uh, the, you know, like women uh, tend to be leading indicators like on, across social networks. Um, and so women were the first like predominantly to use like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, right? Women are kind of leading in this way. And so if you're in this group that tends to be the first movers, social networks, then like you understand a use case that maybe no one else in the room understands. And under, like being able to make those connections, I think is is um, is tremendously important. And so 
that's the first piece of advice is to recognize that um, being the only one or being in a position of uniqueness doesn't put you in it at an advantage, at, at, at a disadvantage. It, um, it, in a lot of ways, is advantageous and, um, and is a real strength. Um, and I think the second thing is, uh, is to just don't stop. Like, you know, to, to kind of use the words of like a Sheryl Sandberg, it's really to lean into that, um, that experience and, uh, and don't let it stop you. Like I, you know, I had um, the experience of really like I really lived it while I was a student here, the, the notion of imposter syndrome. Like I didn't feel like I belonged. I felt like I was an imposter. Like everyone else knew that they didn't belong and opted out and I was still in it and I didn't realize like, oh, everyone else knows this and I don't know, right? I felt like I, I didn't belong. And so, um, you know, if, I, if, if that had stopped me, uh, then like I might not have been in a position that I'm in. I definitely, well, so I definitely wouldn't have been in a position that I'm in today. But I also don't believe that, um, you know, I, it, it wouldn't have been good uh, for the world in the extent to which I could have impact in the areas and the communities that I really care about. And so I wouldn't have even lived up to my full potential. Okay, we have another one right here. First off, thank you for being here today. Uh, my question actually uh, is kind of concerning one of the things you mentioned as you were talking earlier. I recently read an article that talked about the idea of Steve Jobs having a lot of trouble coming up today if he were to be coming up today with it, because he never really wrote a line of code for Apple. And so, uh, he, because obviously he just was primarily concerned with the marketing aspect. My question for you is, is as someone who tends to be the non-technical co-founder uh, and someone who's very interested in tech startups, uh, how important do you think it is to go ahead and learn and really devote the time to learning the technical side of things in order to uh, be successful in, this, in today's world? Sure. AJ's developers are beating up on him a little bit right now. That's why he's asking you this question. <laughs> I don't, I, so, um, I don't think it's impossible to be um, in a position of influence in Silicon Valley and not have a background in tech. Um, I do think it is important to understand technology, right? So you might not necessarily know how to code, um, but just being able to understand the implications of the work that you're trying to, that your, your company or your team is trying to accomplish, I think is, is tremendously important. For, for you as a leader, if you're interested in being a, a you know, founder, a co-founder, like, if your co-founder is technical and you're not, like, um, in order to have a real appreciation for the value that your technical co-founder is bringing to the table, I think you have to like at least attempt to understand and have a base level of understanding of what um, it means to build the product that you're, that you're building. Like how long does it really take to build this new feature? How long does it, like how hard of a technical feat is it to overcome like X, Y, and Z that you're asking for? Um, and so I think that's, I think that's really important um, for you, but it's also really important um, for you to gain credibility with your team uh, in that way, right? Because in a lot of ways, like particularly in the role of a product person, um, you don't necessarily have formal authority over your engineering team, right? Like they report to an engineering manager. Um, and so how do you have, so you know, the question is like, how do you lead without formal authority? And I think the way that you do that is to establish credibility. If people on your team trust that you are in a, like you understand um, all of the assumptions that you're making uh, that are inputs to your decision, and if they believe that you really get it, then they trust the decision that you're making, right? And so I think that is, that is so I think that's the extent to which it's important. We have another question over here. Thank you. So you talked a little bit about how it's important for your goals to like align with company goals to see the broader vision, uh, just to really have a good idea of what you want to do going forward. Um, so I guess my question is a little bit more personally, like what do you see yourself, how do you define your success? What kind of legacy do you want to leave? What's the most important objective for you, regardless of what company you're at, where you see yourself going forward? Sure. What's guiding you? That's, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's... Wait, let's make this question harder. Uh-oh. There's a meteor hurtling towards this auditorium right now. We're all going to be taken out. What's the one thing you're going to regret that you haven't accomplished yet in your career? Yeah, I've, so the thing that I'm absolutely the most passionate about is, um, and this may be surprising, but it's really um, s serving an underserved and underprivileged community. So if you think about my background and the things that, that I've shared, um, right, like there, I, I was, for me growing up, there was a significant access gap and exposure gap. There's no reason that I should have started 
college um, without having any understanding of computer programming, right? And so that means that for me, there was a gap. Um, and, and that gap existed despite the fact that I literally maxed out in the environment that I was in. I took every single AP class in college, I mean in high school. I took every single AP class that was offered in high school, like graduated at the top of my class. I was a leader in, the, in, in school as well as in the community. Like there was nothing more else I, I could have done but yeah, I started college behind. And I, I like to me, that just shouldn't happen, right? And so I have a, like a passion for, um, for, 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 for people who are in this situation where you know, like, they are maxing out in their current environment. It just so happens they were born in an environment that is underprivileged and underserved, right? And so how do you ensure that there is, a, um, that there is social mobility, there's an opportunity for those people who are absolutely passionate about like being the best person that they can be um, and really contributing to the world in a real way, but just like don't have access to, to achieve those things and don't even know how, like how do you even know what to, um, what to aspire to achieve if you've never been exposed to, to like success at a high level? Um, and- well, well, you've been quoted as saying you're never too young to start being a mentor. So you're kind of leading into the whole area of mentorship right now. I mean, who have some of your best mentors been and why do they get that best designation from you? I, I, I've, I've, I consider, there's so many people in my life who have um, had tremendous influence on me. I mean, peers, like classmates, peers, also people who are older. I mean, a lot of folks, have had an influence on me who I consider to be a mentor and they might not even necessarily look at me as a mentee or a, a protege. Um, and so like, um, there are a couple like inflection points in my life that were just like these kind of critical moments that really significantly altered uh, my life trajectory. And so like one is like freshman year and, um, and, and after my freshman year in college, I interned at General Motors. And my manager at the time, like literally went out of her way to teach me how to network. Like I didn't even, I didn't know what networking meant. I did you know, how do you write an email? How do you reach out to people, ask them for lunch? What's an informational interview? These are all things I, I didn't know about at the time. And she literally taught me um, that process, like tremendously beneficial. Um, the summer before my senior year in college, I interned at, General Mo at um, Morgan Stanley. And I was in this program, a summer internship program, and I was assigned a uh, mentor through that program. And that woman uh, has been like extremely influ influential in my life ever since. Um, she's the reason, I mean, she uh, was beneficial in terms of me being a full-time employed at Morgan Stanley. She was beneficial in terms of um, me thinking about business school and grad school. I wrote, um, I applied to uh, business school and um, you know, applied to, to Harvard. I wrote, at the time there were six essays um, that were a part of the application process. And I wrote 11 versions of those six essays, right? So 66 essays. And she literally reviewed every single essay, like tremendously beneficial. And she was just like, you know, Aaron, look, I just need you, like there's no way you can really thank me for this. You just have to pay it forward. So you have to make sure that like, if anyone ever reaches out to you and is interested in applying to Harvard Business School, you make time for them in the same way that I made time for you. And so like, that's the best way I could thank her. So every single time I've been a part of someone's process, I you know, ping her uh, with, the, with the acceptance letter if, uh, if that's how it works out. One more from up here. Yeah, first off, thank you for uh, speaking here. I wanted to give a shout out to Southfield. I used to work on Telegraph Road at uh, oh, Lear awesome. Corporation. Um, you know, speaking on uh, industries ripe for uh, disruption, it seems like wealth management, uh, with with the proliferation of, of robo advisors like Wealthfront, Betterment, yep. Motif Investing. Yep. Um, you know, I grew up learning about investing and 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 going to Investopedia by starting at Yahoo Finance. Wow. But um, I'm I, I feel like Yahoo Finance specifically it, it almost assumes sort of background knowledge in a lot of uh, ways, and I'm interested in if you if you have any thoughts on making uh, Yahoo Finance specifically more accessible uh, to the average investor uh, and, and helping making the capital markets more accessible. I'm, uh, personally, I'm, I'm starting a social impact investing robo-advisor with another guy from Stanford, and um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on trying to manage a startup remotely. I'm actually a law student here, 
Um, wow. So, so just two questions, really. Your your thoughts on Yahoo Finance going forward and on on managing a startup remotely? Sure. Um, so first of all, good luck on your startup. I think that's fantastic. Uh, it sounds really interesting. If I can be helpful, definitely um, let me know. The second, so in terms of answering your questions, I think um, how do you make Yahoo Finance better? And you know, it's really a question of like how do you make every Yahoo uh, product better? Because I think we have a long way to go. No one at Yahoo. And when you work on a product, like you're never just satisfied with your product, right? Particularly as a product manager. And so, I think Yahoo Finance plays a, has played a specific role ever since it launched. Um, and I think you're dead on in terms of the problem that 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 that, that product solves, right? Specifically around providing access um, or or a level of information to um, the average like person who might be interested, but already has an aptitude for um, the financial markets, right? Um, and so I think that is tremendously valuable, still, it's still valuable to this day, and that's like how you, how you value Yahoo Finance, or that's how you like attempt to, to place evaluation on, on that product. Um, I'm not sure if I necessarily agree that, um, so I think that's their core competency. I'm not sure if I agree that they should kind of go outside of that, but I think they could be, I think Yahoo Finance could be much better at solving that problem for users, and if I, um, we're in, in a product role for the Yahoo Finance product, like that's what I would be focused on. Um, and, I, and I am confident that, uh, that you'll begin to see some really interesting things over the next six to 12 months um, in that product, so. If you weren't wildly happy where you are now, is there a product or company in the Valley where you're like, they are hot and what they're working on is so cool, I would love to do that? Yeah, there are a bunch of, um, you know, it's a, it is it's such an exciting time in Silicon Valley right now, I think. Um, it's, it's a unique time in that, um, like, the extent to which mobile really matters is changing everything. This started in 2007, um, but it's, it, it, you know, obviously when the smartphone, the initial iPhone launched in 2007, but the, it's been true, like, again and again, like, year over year. Um, so right now what's really interesting is the fact that um, people spend more time in terms of man hours inside an app um, in the U.S. than they do online, like in a website. And so, like, that changes things. And this is, so it's, like, everything that we know is being disrupted and companies are now being built, right? So you think about companies like Uber and, and Lyft, that, did, that those companies aren't possible without... Um, um, a mobile phone, right? The fact that your phone is on, with you at all times, the fact that your phone is um, deeply personal, it has sensors, it has this state-of-the-art camera, right? Like the iPhone literally disrupted um, the camera industry, right, Kodak. Um, and so, you know, these, all of these things change the way that people live and operate, and it changes like, um, you know, messaging, right? WhatsApp like really changed the globe because it now brings people closer together who aren't, you know, and you previously didn't have access to, to those communication channels. And so I think um, it's, it, because it's such an exciting time in Silicon Valley, because of the extent to which mobile really plays a role in our life and it's changing the dynamics, I think um, every company that is really focused um, or that is in a position to leverage these unique mobile type opportunities are primed uh, for success and that are at the forefront of disruption. So I think about like marketplaces, right? So companies I think that are really exciting right now are companies like Instacart and I think the product Google Shopping Express is, is, is vastly um, exciting to me. Like they're solving these logistic problems of you know, Uber um, in the world that, that didn't, um, that weren't even possible without this new like technology. Um, you know, Internet of Things. I think that's like, well, I don't even think we're at the beginning of what that really means, right? What does it mean to be a smart device in your household, in your, in your life, in your office? Um, and I think that's beginning, that's going to change the way that we, like that we know life, um, right? So like if all of a sudden your oven and your microwave can now tell you when food is done, like that changes how you think about your time, right? Like Google Shopping Express literally changed my life in that like I haven't been to a convenience store. I haven't been to a CVS or a Walmart or um, to, to purchase a dry goods in, in, in two years, over two, almost two and a half, three years. Um, this changed, changed my life. It made me far more efficient. It solves problems for me. You know, Uber's changing people's lives in that, um, you know, Uber now replaces a need for a second car. It makes life more efficient uh, for people. People potentially may not have cars because um, Uber and Lyft are so accessible. I think 
Um, so I think companies that are at the forefront of this are really interesting. There's also an interesting thing happening in the enterprise space. So I think about a company like Slack that is changing the way that teams operate and communicate with one another. Um, immensely fascinating. Like, so the companies that excite me the most are companies that are solving problems that I have today. Like I hate email and it's because it's just inefficient. Like it just hasn't evolved, right? Like the way you attach a document and send an email now is the same way that existed when uh, email initially launched, right? And it frustrates me. And so, you know, you look at a company like Slack that is literally changing the way that teams communicate. It's disrupting web-based email. Um, and that is, I think, those are the companies that are at the forefront of innovation and those are companies I'm excited about. So we're gonna have to wrap up here. So um, last question. Obviously, you have the benefit of, oh, don't worry, it's not a bad one. You have that look on your face. <laughs> so when you were 17 and you cried, right. no, um, here's your Oprah moment. All right, I'm ready. No, so you have the benefit of hindsight now. Is there a course or something that you wish that you had either taken or learned while you were here? Like you mentioned earlier, you got lucky because you got a mentor that showed you how to network. Or is there something where you thought, like, wow, this is going to be really important in my career, this, you know, Eeks course 441 and what a waste, never mattered, versus, wow, I wish I had learned more soft skills. Or what can these guys take with them in terms of, if you get a chance to do this while you're here, I believe this will help you because I would have changed things if I'd known. Sure, great, 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 great question. I think a couple things, the, like being at Michigan, and I, I don't think I really had an appreciation for this at the time, but being at Michigan is so unique because it is one of the few institutions that has top 10 ranked um, programs, academic programs in like almost every area, right? Like law, public policy, engineering, obviously, um, business, right? Like literally top 10 programs across the board in all of these areas. And um, I was very depth focused in my education while I was here. And it was great because I left with a proficiency in, uh, in all things related to software development. Um, it was not great because I didn't, I was like at this unique institution and I didn't take advantage of all of the different opportunities in terms of learning. Um, and so, like I regret not taking an economics class. Um, and so I wasn't even exposed to like macroeconomics until, um, until, until business school. Um, and in fact, like that breadth of education is, is one of the reasons that, that I went to business school. And so I think, you know, I, I, I had that opportunity here and I didn't take advantage of it. And, and so I, I would highly recommend um, just kind of leveraging this experience to really become um, just like a, a, to have a holistic education. Um, and I think I think that's the first thing. I think one thing I did do really well that um, that I would do over again and again and again is uh, the student leadership experiences. Um, that prob like those soft skills to your point that I learned as a student leader here um, set a foundation for me like in terms of leading and running teams um, that, that has been invaluable throughout, throughout the course of my career, um, tremendously valuable. So I would say, you know, take advantage of this kind of unique experience that we have at Michigan that makes this is a world, world renowned education and then also like, you know, really sort of challenge yourself um, to, to lead and to learn how to lead and organize people. Is starting your own company on your roadmap? I get asked that often, um, and my answer is uh, yes and no, and the reason is because um, being a so founder, politics are in your future. Definitely isn't? not. <laughs> definitely not. That's something I'm very clear about. Um, I will never be a politician. But so, so um, I think being a founder CEO uh, of a startup is often like one of the hardest. Um, it is probably the hardest uh, career job um, that, that I'm familiar with. And, um, and I only think it's worth it, right? So there's a cost to leadership. I only think being a founder CEO is worth it from an entrepreneurial perspective when, um, one, you believe something that no one else believes, right? Like you have a belief that like as you test it with people, people almost think that you're like insane for believing what you believe is true. 
right? And so, and because of that, um, you are uniquely positioned to pursue that idea in a way that no one else is. And I think having those two things are a requirement to being an amazing founder CEO. Um, and for me, I don't want to be an entrepreneur or a founder CEO just for the sake of doing it. I don't think it's worth it. I don't think it's worth the title. I think there are many ways you can be successful, right? There are many ways you can skin a cat, right? Um, but, but, but be a founder CEO with purpose, um, I think then it makes, that's the only way to balance out um, the extent to which there is a cost to, to leadership in that way. All right, well, our time is up, but thank you very much, Aaron. Let's give Aaron a round of applause. And that, that company crashed and burned. And unfortunately, with, with the way the games work, it's a very hit-driven business. So if your game doesn't take off, your, your company's over.